Good morning. Let us rise and join together in worship.
please remain standing for prayer. Joy to the world. The Lord has come. Uh, during this uh, Advent season, it, it's so easy to get swept up into that, that corporate joy, that great celebration from old. And yet, it, it, would, it would be amiss to, to neglect, to, to mention the struggles that we're all going through as, as a society, as, as a people, as a community. And, and so we might be tempted to ask that question, how, how can we celebrate? How can we still have that joy? I'm encouraged by scriptures uh, like from the prophet Zechariah 4.6, where he tells us, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, please bow with me as we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that uh, you have revealed yourself to us, Lord. You have revealed yourself to us uh, through uh, your word from, from time uh, past, uh, ages ago, through the words of the prophet, uh, handed down to us by generations of forefathers and mothers, godly uh, ones who, who came before us, who, who uh, Lord, set the, set the path clear for us, Lord, to, to know who you were. Father, we just thank you that you have, uh, Lord, passed down your word to us, Lord, uh, without error, Lord, that we might know who you are with clarity, Lord, with, with understanding. Father, it's amazing, Lord, that the, the unimaginable could be made known to us, and, and yet you have made yourself known to us. Father, you are, you are amazing, and we give you praise, Lord. You alone deserve our praise. This morning, we lift you high, Lord, and, and we know that you are able to, to answer any and all of our prayers. And so, Lord, we come before you boldly and with confidence. But first, Lord, we, we know we, we need to set things right. We need to confess, Lord, that you are not always the center of our attention, Lord. You, you are not always the first one that we go to, Lord, when we're seeking help. You, you are not always, uh, Lord, the, the one, Lord, um, that we desire with all our hearts. This morning, Lord, we pray that you will sweep aside any obstacles, anything that stands between us and you. Lord, that you will clear away any distractions, Lord, any misunderstandings, Lord, in our minds and our hearts. Father, we, we pray, Lord, to, to truly have you in the center of our, of our uh, midst this morning, Lord. We invite you in, Lord. We pray for your Holy Spirit to come and fill us uh, fresh, to fill us to overflowing, Lord that there might be no, uh, no gaps or places, Lord, left unfilled, Lord, uh, to fill with other things, Lord. We, we truly desire and seek, Lord, to, to uh, Lord, give ourselves completely to you. And so this morning, Lord, we just uh, ask for your forgiveness if, if we've been wayward. We ask for your forgiveness if we've been distracted, Lord. We ask for your forgiveness, Lord, uh, for, for anything that we might have done that is unseemingly, Lord, or, Father, um, Lord, that, that has fallen short and miss the mark. This morning, Lord, we come to you unburdened, Lord, for we know, Lord, that you are ready to forgive. Father, we, we lift up to you, Lord, a thankfulness, Lord, that you have um, inclined to us, Lord, that, that you have uh, broken through time and, and space, Lord, to, to, to meet with us, Lord, on, on, on this plane, Lord. You've given us a savior. You've given us Christ in the flesh, Father, that we might uh, know you intimately, Lord. Father, and, and be convinced, Lord, that you love and care about us. Father, we are so thankful, Lord, that Christ came, and, and more than that, that he is a person that, that we can turn to, Lord. Lord, you, you are not just a thought, a grand concept, a big idea. You are a person, Lord, and you made that clear in Christ. We are so thankful, Lord. And Lord, so we lift up to you, Lord, our, our concerns, Lord. We lift up to you our concerns for this for this country we live in, Father, that, that you have placed us in. Father, we pray, Lord, that, that you will sweep across this nation, Lord, with, with um, Lord, your Holy Spirit, Lord, to, to bring peace and, and unity where there is strife and, and where there, there is uh, unrest. Father, we, we pray, Lord, that there will be an end to, to, the, to the protests, uh, the, the violent protests, Lord. We pray, Lord, that, that, that calm minds and, and, and persons of peace will prevail, Lord. We pray for dialogue in this country, Lord. 
Father, we know that nothing can be gained, Lord, by, by shouting and, and, and by, by violence. Lord, we just pray that there'll, there'll be leaders that will raise up, Lord, that can lead us, Lord, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, peaceful conversation, Lord, dialogue, Lord, about our differences. Father, I pray that, that we will focus on uh, the important things, the, the things that, that matter, the things of truth, Lord, and, and not let the lesser things divide us. Father God, we, we pray, Lord, that um, for, our, for our president-elect, Lord, that you uh, even now prepare him and his staff and, Lord, uh, all those uh, who gather around him, Lord, uh, with wisdom, Lord, for the challenges that he will face in just a, a few short weeks. Father, there's so much that is facing our country now, Lord, uh, from the, the calamity of the pandemic, Lord, from uh, the, the societal issues, Lord, that, that divide us, Lord, race issues, Lord, that... Uh, never seem to go away. Father, we pray for wisdom. Lord, we pray, Lord, uh, on the local level, Lord, this city is struggling, Father. Uh, so many are unemployed or underemployed. Father, uh, the social nets seem to be disintegrating. Father, we pray, Lord, that you will raise up those who have to be able to, to help those who have not. Father, we pray for, for kindness and, and generosity to, to be the models and the hallmarks of this day. Father, uh, we know that everything is possible in you, Lord, and so we pray for your mighty power, your, your, your grace that enables, Lord, to, to equip your church to, to be your hands and feet now at this time here in our city. Father, for, for, the, for the huge numbers of those who are, who are homeless, Lord, who, who are hurting, Father, who don't see uh, a path forward, Lord, in their, in their sorrow and their sickness and disease. Father, we raise up to you this community of Flushing. We know it's been hard hit during this pandemic season. Lord, we pray for, for our, our social net here, Lord. We know that um, there's many ills, Lord, and Lord, we, we pray, Lord, we pray fervently against these evils in our community, Lord. Lord, that there will be an end to uh, domestic violence. There will be an end to the human trafficking, Lord. That you will bring peace into our community, Lord, that we will be united, Lord, here in Flushing. Father, I pray that you will go out from First Baptist, Lord, that, that you will uh, use what, what, we, what we have worked so hard to build for you, Lord. That, that Lord, this new building to, to my left, Lord, uh, has been uh, under construction for so long. Father, I pray that the construction project will finally come to an end. Lord, that um, it will be completed in safety, Lord, and, and Lord, that it'll be wonderful, Lord, a great place to, to spread your word, Lord, uh, to promote uh, peace and, and, and unity and, and love in this community. I just pray that you will use the ministries here at First Baptist, Father. I pray a hedge about the pastors and ministers and leaders and teachers, and Lord, and all who seek to serve. Father, that you will keep them focused, Lord, and, and not distracted, Lord, by uh, th there's so many uh, wickedness in, in the world today, Lord. Father, we know that you, you are the, the, the focus and the, the true center of, of why we're here, our purpose, Father. And so we, this morning, I, I pray, Lord, that you will bless the, the mouth of your manservant, Pastor Sanjay, that, that you will speak through him, Lord. You will bring to us the, that word that we need to hear, Lord, that word of cheer, uh, that word that encourages, Father. I just thank you, Lord, for uh, this, this ability, Lord, to come before you in prayer. And Lord, I'm so thankful, Lord, that you, that you hear our prayers and you will answer in your own way. I pray all this in the precious name of Christ Jesus. Amen. Uh, please be seated. Hi, this is Miss Carol. And I'm Miss Soraya. A lot has changed this year. We now have an extra piece of clothing, a mask, and we have to distance ourselves from others. But there is one thing that never changes, Jesus' love for us. The Bible says that nothing can separate us from his love, absolutely nothing. So we can still celebrate Jesus' first coming as a baby, unfolding his plan of salvation for all mankind. This year's children's Christmas program will not be on site, but will still come to you via video. So sit back and listen to our children as they tell the Christmas story from the Gospel of Luke, sing a beloved Christmas song, and send you sincere greetings for a Merry Christmas. And thank you to all you parents and children who worked so hard on this project. And many thanks to Gabe Sugan, our editor. Merry, Merry Christmas! Christmas. 
In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, her the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger, and because there is no guest room available for him. There were shepherds living out in the field nearby. It was night, and they were taking care of their sheep. An angel of the Lord appeared to them. The glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. But, but, but the angel said, do not be a play. I bring you the good news that will, that will cause great joy for all other people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a, a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to the God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. The little Lord Jesus lay down his sweet head. The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus looked down. Merry Christmas and a Happy 
What a wonderful (laughs) commemoration. This morning's reading is taken from Luke 1, verses 39 to 56. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard her greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones, but lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. This is God's word. It's hard to follow that video, but I will certainly do my best. (laughs) It's always a joy for me to share what God has laid on my heart for us this morning. I want to open our time together with a question. How do we know that Christmas time has arrived? By looking at the calendar, perhaps, by going to a local Target or Walmart around the end of October and seeing Halloween costumes in one section, Christmas decorations in one section, and somewhere in some corner of the store, Valentine's Day decorations, maybe. Perhaps it is when the tree is placed in Rockefeller Center and an hour-long TV special is made out of something that usually takes one minute. Here at the church, we decorate both the first and third floors with trees, garland, and empty gift boxes. It's a beautiful sight to see. But perhaps the clearest indicator that Christmas time has arrived is when the radio starts playing Christmas music. You hear the classics like the Christmas song, the carols like Oh Holy Night, or the confusing, like, I want a hippopotamus for Christmas. If I were to ask Pastor Aaron and Connie's son Noah what he wanted for Christmas, it would not be a hippopotamus. <laughs> what you won't hear on the radio is a song within our passage this morning, the Magnificat, the first Christmas song of the church, and perhaps the most important. No matter how you feel about Christmas songs, one thing is clear. These songs elicit some sort of reaction, awe, Sadness, confusion, nostalgia, and perhaps joy. During this Advent season, we highlight four components that the first coming of our Lord Jesus Christ brings. Peace, hope, joy, and love. This morning, we're going to narrow down our focus to to the joy that is highlighted in Luke 1, 39 to 56. If you were to ask a child who grew up here at First Baptist Church in the 90, namely this child, what the definition of joy was, He would have smiled and started singing, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart and looked at you until you said, where? (laughs) And responded with down in my heart. I think you know the rest. A silly song, most certainly. But like I am a Christian, a silly song with a profound message. Rick Warren, author of The Purpose Driven Life, has a profound definition for joy. He says, Joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life 
and the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right and the determined choice to praise God in every situation. Let me say that again. Joy is a settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life, the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right, and the determined choice to praise God in every situation. This is a great definition for us to meditate on as we pray together, asking God to open our minds and our hearts as we unpack our text this morning. Let's pray. Father, I, this morning I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. We invite you to move in our midst this morning. We give you all the glory. In your name we pray. Amen. As we look at Luke 1, we see the personality of the writer Luke start to show art itself very clearly in the text. Luke, for those of you who may, may or may not know, is the first in a two-volume account that includes the book of Acts. The book of Luke is written as an orderly account to a man named Theophilus, and Luke prides himself on the certainty of which he's written the gospel. Luke is what we call a Renaissance man. He's a man of many talents and interests. He's a physician by, location, by vocation, but he's also a historian, a theologian, and a musician. A combination of Thomas Chen, So Ban Chu, Pastor Gary Nicole, all combined into one individual. <laughs> Luke 1 is centered around four narratives. The first narrative speaks of Zachariah's encounter with the angel Gabriel who informed him that his wife Elizabeth, who is past the age of child-rearing, will have a son to be named John. The second narrative is where the angel Gabriel appears to young Mary and informs her that she will be the bearer of the son named Jesus, who will be the great and son of the Most High. The third is our text this morning, and the fourth is where the birth of John comes through to fruition. It is through the lens of joy that we dive into our text this morning. If you're following along with your bulletin in person or at home, you'll see the first point is as follows. Joy is a settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life. Our text reads this way. At the time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zachariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. The English Standard Version, version says that she went with haste. We understand that Mary would have been a young woman between the ages of 12 and 15. She's betrothed to a man named Joseph. She would have been in seclusion, not in quarantine, until the day of her wedding. She would have asked her parents to take a three to four day journey from Nazareth to Judea, a town about 100 miles away. There, were, there are no Amtraks or Ubers at the time, so haste in terms of speed is unlikely. Somewhere along the way, she conceives her son, and she's going to this house because the angel says something to her prior in chapter 1 to point her in that direction. Verse 36 says this, Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her own age, old age, and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month, for no God, no word from God will ever fail. What a word of assurance this must have been for Mary, and for all of us as well, that God is in control even in the midst of the unlikeliest of situations. Although their pregnancies overlap and are the results of miracles taking place, they are not one and the same. While Elizabeth is barren, she is not a virgin, and Zachariah is the natural father of her son. Mary, on the other hand, is a virgin. While the full extent of the impact of their children is unknown at the time, it is God's power that the greatest blessing to come to the earth will come to fruition, and these cousins will be the vessels through which it takes place. We also see that God is in control once Mary enters Elizabeth's house. Verse 41. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. There are a couple of points to note in this verse. The first is that Mary's greeting was one of surprise. She could not call or text ahead saying she was on her way, and so she arrives unexpectedly, and the ministry of John the Baptist begins before he was even born. John the Baptist bears witness to God's power and the fulfillment of the words from the angels earlier in the chapter. Luke 1.14 says, And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. If a baby who has not entered the world can exhibit joy, what more opportunities do we have to exemplify joy in a world that desperately needs it 
especially at this point in our history. The second point to look at is the phrase filled with the Spirit. We can see that the birth of John the Baptist and Jesus Christ is Trinitarian in nature. The triune God is present and is working in, in, in these two women and their children. In Galatians 5, we read these words, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The gift of joy is proof that the Spirit is active and present at this time. Yet it is important to distinguish between the context of being filled with the Spirit here in Luke and the indwelling of the Spirit in Acts. The difference is in that the act of being filled with the Spirit is a divine act of God for the purpose of bringing a clear message to a certain group, certain, to a certain person or group of people, very similar to the working of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. We see this in Exodus, where Moses, though slow of speech, is given the words to speak to the Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. In the following verses, the Father has a very clear message from Mary, and he's going to use Elizabeth to deliver that message. In contrast, the Spirit who indwells the believers in Acts 2 is a gift that during his ascension, Jesus leaves the disciples to empower them to spread the gospel to the nations. Verse 42. In a loud voice she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is, is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. God's spirit-led message to Mary is clear. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the child you will bear. In verse 43, we see that Elizabeth counts herself as favored when Mary visits her. As a woman who would have been barren, she waited her whole life for a son. She had very much had, very much had given up on having a child of her own. Although she wanted a son, she needed a savior. It is an additional blessing that the one to bring her her savior is a relative of hers. This is confirmed in the baby in her womb, her womb lead for joy, confirming the words of Gabriel to both Zechariah and Mary. The statement in 45 is, clear, is a clear indication of Zechariah's disbelief and Mary's belief and that we can be sure that God is in control. Our second point is as follows. Joy is a co quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right. Verse 46 begins one of the four songs of praise in the book of Luke. Remember that Luke is a musician, and so his gospel contains four songs that are connected to the birth of Christ. The first of which is Mary's song, of praise, the Magnificat. This song is referred to as the Magnificat because of the first line of the song. My soul magnifies the Lord, or in the Latin, bear with me here, Magnificat anima me dominum. I hope I got that right. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. As we read these first two verses, we see a resemblance to another song from another expectant mother who experienced her own miracle. Mary, though she is young and female, would have been well versed in the songs of both Hannah and Deborah in terms of strong women who, who, in the Bible who praise God through song. Turn with me to 1 Samuel 2, verse 1 to 10. We read, and Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth der derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken but the feeble bind on strength. Those who are, who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who, have ceased, who are hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren have borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. 
the Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down a shield and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness. For not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces against the thun them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. We have seen the growth and spiritual maturity of a young woman who grew up on the teachings of the Old Testament and naturally gravitated towards the stories of both Hannah and Deborah as examples of faithful women. Mary has grown from the young woman who had fear when Gabriel came to her to the young woman who sought out the one relative who could identify with the miracle she was experiencing in her own life to a woman who expresses herself in a song of praise. This is from a young woman who would have been illiterate and not been given the same educational opportunities as the young men her age. How often do we take the time to lift up the name above all names in the midst of the busy season that is Advent, especially this year during a pandemic? We can take a lesson from Mary here to magnify the Lord and exalt his name together. Verse 48 says, For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. At first, these verses look to look as if they seem to contradict one another. How can she be humble one minute and be blessed by generations the next? Mary is truly humble to be the mother of the Savior. Mary is just an ordinary girl from an ordinary family. She herself is nothing special. But her faith is an example to all of us of how our circumstances do not inhibit our ability to praise God for what he is doing in our lives and what he is going to do. It is her humble estate that God sees, and in many ways, he sees her. In a society where women are inferior compared to men, and as a young woman, she would have been used, used as a bargaining chip between two families, God says, no, Mary, I see you. I see your faith, and I'm going to use you to bring so the Savior to the world. How many of us feel like Mary? Invisible, forgotten, passed over, taken for granted. God sees Mary, and he sees us too. He sees our brokenness, our pain, our sorrow, and our hearts. Psalms remind us, reminds us that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. May we feel the joy that comes with the truth that God sees us too in our humble estate and promises that he has a plan for our lives and that he will bring it to completion. There's something else to be addressed. Mary is not to be blessed because she is without sin or because she is a mediator or because she is worthy to be worshiped. Mary is blessed because just like you and I, she was a sinner. Yet God used her to bring the Savior into the world. God has deemed her worthy to be saved by the Savior, and thus she is blessed, as we are blessed to take part in the resurrection of Christ. This is a reason to be joyful, and that everything is going to be okay. God de deems us worthy of sending his son down as a baby to die on the cross for our sins. Number three, joy is a determined choice to praise God in every situation. James 1, 2 reminds us, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of different kinds, because the, you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Mary moves from a place of personal worship and reflection on what God has done in her life to one of prophetic worship 
of what God has done and what God is going to do. She begins with praising God for what he has done for his people and concludes with what he will do for the church in the future. You might have been wondering why I have the snow globe here. See, the, the word, see, the world is used to operating one way, an ungodly way. And Mary prophesies that God will come and turn the world upside down. Our God, who is just, looks at the world through its history and addresses the wrongs. We have fallen so far away from his plan that in Mary's praise, he intervenes on our behalf. She begins by praising God for what he has done to the oppressors of his people. Verse 51. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. This is a moral reversal. Mary recalls God's strength in the history of her people, where God rains down the plagues upon Egypt in order for his people to be freed from the bondage of slavery. Verse 52. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. This is a social reversal. Mary, in her praise, also acknowledges that God brings down the mighty, those that use the pow their power for evil in our society. God is not impressed by earthly fame, wealth, or success, but he lifts up those in humble estate. He brought down the kingdom of Saul in order to raise up King David, who grew up as a simple shepherd boy. As 1 Samuel 16, 7 reminds us, the Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Mary believes, as do we, that what he did once, he will in fact do again in the future, vanquishing Satan and putting an end to his power in this world once and for all. 53, he's filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent and away empty. This is a spiritual reversal. Mary praises God for how he's provided for the needs of his people, whether they have little or more. As John reminds us in his gospel, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling to eternal life. For they will hunger and thirst for more than their, just their daily bread. They will hunger and thirst for righteousness, and they will be filled. The second half of, of Mary's prophetic uh, praise is in regards to what he will do for the church. Verse 54. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Uh, Mary remains three months and returns home. Finally, God, Mary praises God for his mercy. This has been promised since the time of Abraham, the patriarch of the Israelites. This also speaks to what he will do for the church. And because we are descendants of Abraham through faith, God's mercy extends to us forever and ever. And as the story goes, John the Baptist is born in the next section of Luke. This morning, we've been talking about joy through the eyes of the mother of our Savior. We have discovered that joy is a settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life, that even in the midst of being separated from family and friends, loss of a job, uncertainty during the pandemic, and other hardships that have occurred, and even when we feel unhappy with our circumstances, we can still find joy from the Holy Spirit. We can also have the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right. People may look at us and why we seem to be unfazed by everything that may go wrong or awry. These are the moments where we can share the joy we have in Christ, not just during the Advent season, but all year round. Finally, we can have joy and choose to praise God in every situation, whether they are good or bad. We can praise God for what he has done in our lives and what he is going to do. Perhaps you are here this morning and you do not know this joy that we've been talking about. You've been on the fence about Jesus or Christianity, but if, if God has been speaking to you, whether you're here in person or at home, 
I want to invite you to pray along with us in a few minutes and confess to God that you, like Mary and Elizabeth, are in need of a Savior. And perhaps you've been a Christian for a long time, but your joy has been lacking lately due to the circumstances around you. I invite you to come to the Lord and ask him by the power of the Holy Spirit to renew the joy in your heart so that you in turn can spread his joy to those who need it most. I'll begin with prayer to the invitation to come to faith in Christ and then conclude this time of our service in prayer. Let's pray. God, I know that I am a sinner. I know that I deserve the consequences of my sin. However, I am trusting in Jesus Christ as my Savior. I believe his, that his death and resurrection provided for my forgiveness. I trust in Jesus and Jesus alone as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord, for saving me and forgiving me. Amen. Jesus, thank you for becoming Emmanuel, God, with us. It is because of you that we can experience true joy. We admit that sometimes be, it can sometimes feel hard to be joyful in the midst of a busy or difficult season. But when the cares of my heart are many, you comfort, your comfort gives me renewed hope and cheer. So today I choose to take refuge in you and rejoice. I will sing for joy because you are my strength and my salvation. In your presence there is fullness of joy, and because of your humble arrival over 2,000 years ago, I am now able to experience the joy of your presence forever. Thank you. You are always worthy of all glory, honor, and power. And so ma no matter what I face, I will choose to worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Uh, Sanjay, thank you so much for that very encouraging sermon. We really appreciate it. Um, if you're here, take a moment to turn to your neighbor, wave at them. If you're tuning in from home, welcome. Why don't you type in the comment section, hello and good morning to your neighbors, or good afternoon since we're almost at the afternoon hour. So we're going to keep it nice and short and sweet. We got a, just a couple of announcements. So the first one is in the back of your bulletin, and it will be on the screen if you're tuning in at home. We have our candlelight service on December 24th at 6 o'clock. We are offering the option to have the service in person or virtually if you can't tune in. Um, much like we have been doing it every service, uh, we have limited capacity for seating. So if you're able to join us uh, on, on Christmas Eve, wonderful. If not, you can go to our Facebook page and you can tune in. Uh, just be mindful that when you come, again, seats will be limited. You'll have your temperature checked and also sign in will be required. So. Uh, if you can tune, if you can join us, we would love to do that. It's a great way to um, gear up for and, and get in the mode of what the true essence and meaning of Christmas is. I know that this pandemic has been a little bit uh, has showered our Christmas spirit in whatever way, in some way, but I think this is a great way to get in the mode and to be gently reminded of the true meaning of Christmas. Um, so there's that. Uh, I'd like to call up Hazel. Um, she has a, uh, she, she wants to share an announcement with you all. Good morning, everyone. I'm here to give an, <laughs> I'm here to give an update on um, an orphanage that First Baptist Church has, uh, has given money to, to assist them. We have a short PowerPoint. Before this, go back, please, go back. <laughs> One more picture back. Previous picture. Okay, before this <laughs> was the next picture. <laughs> okay. Please go back to the next picture. <laughs> Here, this is my brother Carl. He gave me away about 30 years ago in this very church. We walked down that aisle. And um, then, of course, it was the marriage to Gary. <laughs> okay. So after serving 22 years in the United States Air Force, my brother Carl, um, he, he rose from an airplane mechanic to be a co-pilot. He loves planes, by the way. Um, he and his wife uh, sponsor about 36 children in the country of Liberia after he retired from the Air Force. And in his travels, a couple of pastors invited him to come to Uganda because of they heard of what he was doing. So as a result, he ended up with a local Ugandan sponsoring this orphanage called Light Star of Jesus. This, star, this orphanage has about um, 128 children right now. And the mission of uh, my brother's ministry is to deliver hope and help to the children of Uganda. Uganda is one of the poorest countries in Africa with a long civil war, political turmoil, and economic strife. Added to this mix is the spread of AIDS, HIV, as well as various contagious diseases such as Ebola. As a result of these, Uganda has many orphans. These orphans are subject to exploitation, preyed on by adults, forced to work as uh, unpaid slaves, and even prostitutes. Without comfort, shelter, or education, there is little hope for the future of the orphans in Uganda. Now, a bit more background. Close to about 60% of Uganda's population are children below the age of 18. 15% of all the children in Uganda, about 2.9 million, have been orphaned due to terminal illness or death of their parents. Nearly half of this is due to AIDS, HIV. So you can imagine, just think, 68% of the boys who age out of the system, the orphanage system that is, commit a crime within five years. And about 59% of the girls who age out are involved in prostitution or some kind within the five years as well. Also, 9% who age out commit suicide within five years of leaving the system. This shows a great need for training, education, 
and sharing the love of Christ before the children age out of the system. This seems dire, but we know as believers there is hope, hope through Jesus Christ. Uganda is a country with many natural resources. Oil was recently discovered. Agriculture is a big part of the economy with such stable foods such as maize and uh, green bananas, which they call mitaki, and it's eaten quite a lot. Much of the land is fertile. There's much sunlight, there's sufficient rainfall, and there's a huge labor force. The government has made strides, but much more needs to be done. Okay, I'm sorry. These are some of the pictures of the orphanage. Um, on the side is what used to be, uh, it's really a mud hut, and it was lo locally made with the mud. And in the rain season, um, it melted. It just fell apart, of course, you can imagine. It's just made of mud. So a local church has given the orphanage this plot of land here. And that's just part of the building that the church has helped to pay for, where the boys and girls would eventually sleep. So right now, the girls are sleeping with some families, and the boys are sleeping in the church building someplace else on the compound. This is some of the boys sleeping here, or excuse the girls, and the boys are there. You can follow. The main reason that Uganda is not the breadbasket of the world, like the United States, is due to poor farming methods, improper management leading to soil erosion and nutrient depletion of the soil leading to poor farm yields. As I said before, it's a very fertile country. I mentioned hope. With the love of Christ, light star of Jesus, this, this orphanage is hoping to provide, to provide hope through education to the approximate 128 children. So they will not just be given a fish, but taught how to fish, and therefore be self-sufficient. As I mentioned a few, years, a few months ago, First Baptist became aware of the need, and with the help of the, uh, the deacons and the trustees, donated a sizable portion to help finish the buildings for the children to live and sleep in. So just so you know that the Benevolence Fund is reaping much dividends in this country and the children's lives. And we hope that First Baptist can continue to be involved in the orphanage in many ways to come as it's starting from the ground floor. As you see, there were some previous scenes of what it was like before and how life could be so much better once the orphanage is up and running. Here's fresh water, they're, they're using a filter to get the fresh water. And these are the 128 children that we're helping. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hazel. Um, the rest of your announcements are in the bulletin. At this time, we want to uh, turn uh, to the part of our service where we collect our offering. And as we've been doing it throughout the pandemic, we have been collecting our offering through various methods, primarily through our church website and our church app, which is connected to Tithely. So you can make a one-time donation or a recurring donation that way. Um, we also, if you're here and you have a physical envelope, you can drop it at the offering plates or you can do it snail mail, or you can come into the church Monday through Friday, nine to five, to drop off your offering. Just a reminder that we also have special Christmas and love offerings this season. The Christmas offering will be designated for the general fund, and the love offering will be used as a gift for the pastoral staff. We are gonna be collecting those offerings today, December 20th, next Sunday, and December 24th during the candlelight service. So we thank you very much um, in advance for your giving. Let's pray for the offering. Jesus, we thank you so much for uh, this Christmas season, and thank you, thank you that we can take a moment to just pause from all the distractions in the world, everything that's just been going on, and um, just just uh, uh, t totally taking up our time, and we can focus on the true meaning of Christmas. We can focus on the celebration, the jubilation, the the awe of uh, 
you coming to earth so that we could have eternal life. And that is probably the greatest gift that we could ever have. And Lord, uh, we are cognizant and aware that the Christmas season is all about hope um, and love and, and especially giving. So Lord, I just pray that um, through this offering, I pray, Lord, that it would be that we would all uh, give cheerfully and that it would all be for the improvement and the benefit of our church. We ask all this in your name. Amen. What a wonderful service. I've been so uh, encouraged by it. Thank you, Soraya and uh, Carol again for, and Gabe as well for making that video. You know that kid with one AirPod? Uh, that's my son. <laughs> he sounds just like me. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Sanjay, Pastor Sanjay, for the wonderful message. And uh, thank you. Um, I give thanks to the church for our uh, Ugandan orphanage support. It is good to be able to be a uh, able to meet a tangible need, and uh, we continue to pray and also give to that ministry. So would you all rise with me as we uh, receive the benediction? Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.